Good morning. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Jenna Winters with the Ohio Department of Natural Resources, Division of Parks and Watercraft. It is my pleasure today to introduce two of our naturalists who are going to be talking to you today about Ohio's waterfall. Wa uh, waterfall. <laughs> waterfowl. We will be talking about ducks today. How's that? I would like to introduce, let me send these ladies live. This is Rochelle Gatto from Wingfoot Lake. Say hi, Rochelle. And hi. Cindy Orth from Pima Tuning State Park. Go ahead, ladies. Today uh, we are coming to you live from the Wildlife Education Center at Beaver Creek State Park. This is a wonderful place to come and visit. Anytime you have the opportunity, you will have the opportunity to see many, if not all, of the animals that reside in Ohio and also that reside in North America. So please make a trip to Beaver Creek State Park and the Wildlife Education Center. And now, without further ado, I'd like to get started with On the Wing, Diving into Waterfowl. What are waterfowl? Waterfowl belong to the family Anatidae, and they are in the order and seriforms. But what that what does that mean for the general public? It means waterfowl are large aquatic swimming game birds. In North America, there are 47 species of waterfowl that live in and or migrate through the United States. They each have specific areas where they overwinter, where they live year round, where they migrate through or where they breed. Migrators give us a wonderful pastime to pursue as a bird watcher on a, or a waterfowl hunter, especially during the peak seasons of migration. Waterfowl give us many gifts. They speak to our traveler's heart as they journey in and out of our days. They mark the seasons for us as they move. They provide, they continue to provide food, clothing, and bedding for us as they have done down through the centuries. And they provide immeasurable joy as we participate in the recreational forms of hunting and bird watching. Waterfowl make north and south migrations uh, each year on major flyways. These north and south migrations happen during set times that mark the changing of the seasons. They, uh, North American waterfowl move freely across borders between Mexico, United States, and Canada. They also often travel to Central and South America. When waterfowl travel, they use specific flyways. This slide in the next show two interpretations of our North American flyways. There are different flyway maps, but the borders for each fly flyway fall within similar boundaries on all of them. This one is provided by the US Fish and Wildlife Service. And this one is provided by Audubon National Audubon North American Flyway Map. Ohio waterfall and all and many other birds follow green routes of returning vegetation as they complete their migrations. Ducks and other waterfowl often follow the routes of open water as compared to iced over lakes and ponds. In Ohio, we are part of the Mississippi Flyway. When we begin to talk about individual species, I will be spe speaking in terms of Ohio travel. We will highlight some of the waterfowl's characteristics or adaptations. Webbed feet make them powerful swimmers. Waterproof feathers uh, help when they are spending most of their non-flying time on water. These waterfowl have medium to large size bodies and they are plump usually. They have long necks and short wings typically 
and they have many different kind of bills. Flat bills, spoon bills, serrated bills. These are all different depending on what the dietary habits are. So web feet. Web feet are great for a duck or another waterfowl. They help these birds to swim. The triangular shape of them helps, is designed to help propel the bird. The toes and the webs spread out as the bird pushes backwards. The toes fold forward at, to mini, minimize resistance as the foot is pulled forward. This ability to spread and fold increases propulsion and efficiency. Webbing allows for easier navigation on the mud as well. No nerves or blood vessels are in the duck feet, so they don't freeze. And location on the feet of the feet on the body allow for easier navigation in water or on land. So depending on what kind of duck you are, your feet might be in the front of your body or they might be in the back of your body. Feathers are very important to a bird. Uh, preening is the, uh, be, is the behavior of careful cleaning, arrangement, and oiling of feathers. Feathers are maintained through preening. Oil distribution is important to the bird's health. Oil from the oil gland near the tail is distributed to the feathers through preening. This oily coating on feathers prevents water from settling in the feathers, making them waterproof. This insulates the bird against the cold temperatures of the water. And waterproofing also helps the birds to fly. Oil distribution is good for feather health. Oil keeps the feathers flexible and oil curtails the growth of fungi or bacteria. And since they can't reach their head feathers, they have to preen them. They engage in a behavior called head scratching. So waterfowl typically are viewed uh, in V formation when you see them in the sky. Um, and this really is helpful for their flight. All other birds aside from the lead bird gain lift from the vortices of the birds in front of them. So how are vortices formed, you ask? They are formed by the air rushing over the tip from the high pressure area under the wing to the low pressure area above the wing. The next bird will benefit from the previous bird. This benefits everyone. It is kind of like the lead runner in a race, breaking the wind and diverting it around the other, break, other runners so they get a break, or the truck on the highway breaking up the wind for the vehicles behind it. And also the V formation allows the birds to avoid collision and see others in their flock. So there are basically two kinds of ducks. There are dabbling ducks and diving ducks. Now these ducks uh, are sometimes, there's actually sometimes a third group listed, which is the sea ducks. Um, mostly today I'm gonna to be talking about dabbling and diving ducks. I will go a little further into the explanation as I go forward. From the two pictures above, you can clearly see that one of the differences between dabbling and diving ducks is how they sit on the water. Dabbling ducks are usually on top of the water and diving ducks sit down in the water. Now, dabbling ducks are called puddle ducks. Puddle ducks are dabbling ducks like shallow marshes and creeks or flooded fields. They prefer to dabble and tip up rather than diving or submerging to get their food. Ducks feeding in fields are likely to be dabbling ducks. They forage for grains, seeds, and small insects. Dabblers have a colorful iridescent speculum, which is a rectangular patch of brightly colored feathers at the edge of their hind, at the hind edge of their wing. You can see the speculum on this feather that I'm holding. So the first dabbling duck that I want to talk about today is the mallard. Mallards are our comparison duck for many of the species we will talk about today. Monarchs are the common 
common duck that you will find uh, most recognizable and most anywhere in the United States. In, I, you identify them by their green head, the white ring around their neck, the black and white tail, the white leading edge and trailing edge, which outlines the iridescent blue speculum. They are a native in most of the United States. They migrate into Canada for breeding and into parts of Mexico for overwintering. Their diet includes mostly plant material, seeds, stems, roots, acorns, tree seeds and grains, and thus they are yummy table fare. They also eat insects, crustaceans, mollusks, tadpoles, frogs, earthworms, and small fish. They overnight in the marshes. Their nickname is Greenhead, as you can tell, and they are the most we'll see. Now that is the Drake mallard that I'm holding right now and that you saw on the screen. But we also have the hen mallard. She is very drab and plain and boring, really not. She is prepared to do the main primary job, which is to tend to her young, both on the nest and in the water. And for that to be safe from predators, it's a good idea for her to be camouflaged and blend in. The next duck, which is very similar to uh, the mallard, is called the black duck. Black ducks are an eastern duck. They are seen in the eastern part of the United States on this side of the Mississippi River. Now, that being said, and I will say this in reference to all the ducks that we're talking about today, they have specific flyways, but that doesn't mean you won't see them if you are in a different location. These ducks have wings and they can get many places that aren't in their normal travel route. Black ducks, as I said, are typically in the Atlantic and Mississippi flyways, so we do see them here in Ohio. They don't really nest in Ohio though. They have white wing linings, that's the underside of their wing, and they have dark bodies and dark backs. So they're a little bit darker than a mallard, but they are pretty much like them, and at times they do hybridize with mallards which does create some problems for the true black duck and it uh, leads to a reduction in good habitat. So the black duck is actually on the decline because of that. They prefer the salt marshes where the mallard prefers fresh water. Their name rubrics, their Latin name rubripes actually means red foot and they do have red feet when they are breeding. They are the wariest of ducks and fly fast in small flocks. So my next duck is the pintail. Pintail ducks, wonderful. They are the greyhound of the air. They are fast ducks. They rarely breed uh, along Lake Erie but they do migrate through Ohio. They like open marshes and wetlands, and they eat much aquatic plant life. They have a green, greenish black speculum, which again is in their flight feathers. You can see that as they're flying, uh, not quite as brilliant as the mallard. They have a long pointed tail, a slender neck, a white breast and a white neck stripe, which you can see right here on the back of this bird. They are found throughout the U.S., but they're more prevalent in the western U.S. They push north as soon as the ice thaws, and they're, they they've have suffered from persistent drought and loss of habitat. Their diet changes with the seasons. They eat seeds and nutlets, Grow in growing in moist soils and from aquatic plants. Pintails eat grains and they are also delicious table fare. Gadwalls.
Gadwalls migrate early. They really, really don't like cold weather. They rare, they're rare breeders in Lake Erie marshes. They uh, do travel statewide in migration. They are the only puddle duck with a white speculum. So you can see this white bar on the back of their feathers. It's the only duck, it's the only puddle duck with white. So there's not as much white in the puddle ducks as there are in the diving ducks, as we'll see that shortly. They're um, kind of nondescript, but rather handsome if you look at them up close. The females look very much like the mallard female, and I can show you that. Yes, there. so here you go. You can see both of them side by side. And so it's tough to distinguish them unless you have the drakes also in the picture. They feed in deeper water than most dabbling. So they are found out further when they're eating. The American widgeon, sometimes called the bald pate because it has a white top on its on its head. It's got like a white hat up above. Now, bald pate means white. Okay, these these ducks breed further north than any other of our dabbling ducks. They breed up in Alaska and the Northwest provinces and. Uh, the Northwest Territory. I guess the pintail does breed as far north as they do. They're aquatic grazers. Their speculums are a dark drab olive green, but still quite beautiful. When they are alarmed, they take off quickly. They have twisty turny flights. They have an iridescent, it's hard to tell uh, on this particular one, but they do have an iridescent green stripe behind their eye that goes to the back of their head. They have white belly in the air. So that's how you kind of see them, know what they are from the air. They frequently, uh, they frequent deep waters where divers like redhead and scalp feed. So the divers redhead and scalp, because once the diver have brought their food to the surface, this duck steals the food, the American widgeon. Now we have one called the spoonbill. This, this duck is called the spoonbill for a very uh, simple reason. Its beak is shaped like a spoon. Their head is green, but not nearly as brilliant as the uh, mallard, uh, but you can still spot that green head. They have a white chest, orange or red flanking, a white rump, and a black tail in flight. Their spoon-shaped bill is the most char characteristic, uh, is the most recognizable characteristic, and they use it to strain small animal life and seeds from the shallows. They prefer to eat in shallow mud-bottomed marshes rich in invertebrate life. They're not very palatable as most, or one third of their uh, food is animal matter. They seldom eat on land. They, they migrate early and after the first frost. So now we're, now we're gonna talk about some of our little ducks. The blue winged teal is one little duck that you're gonna probably see in Ohio. This is um, more of an Eastern duck, I would say. Uh, they do breed in the northern part of the U.S. and the southern part of Canada. They migrate first in the fall and last in the spring. They very rarely overwinter here. They have an iridescent green speculum and blue and white in the forewings. They uh, eat mostly seeds, but animal matter in some seasons and they weigh less than a pound. They share the stage with their relative, the cinnamon teal. Now the cinnamon teal is got a cherry red, I mean a tomato red body. 
The cinnamon teal mostly hangs out in the Western United States, but on occasion you might see them here in Ohio. If you do, they probably came in with a flock of blue winged teals. They are rare in the East. Their diet is mainly seeds. And we also have the green winged teal. The green winged teal is the smallest of our North American dabblers. It only weighs about 14 ounces. It has a dark head, a drab body, and green in the trailing edge of each wing. It looks almost a little greenish blue here. They're very hardy. They begin to appear in March in Ohio. They migrate uh, statewide. They nest occasionally in the Western Lake Erie marshes and they overwinter in Ohio if they can find open water. They also nest in Alaska and Canada and they use all four flyways. Their seeds, their diet is seeds in the winter and animal matter in the summer. Smallest of our dabbling ducks. Now I've got the wood duck. Wood ducks are nicknamed Woody. They are a common statewide breeder. They migrate early. They like wet habitat, riparian sounds, borders between ponds, lakes, and the woodlands. They're on the edges. They live in nest boxes. They have a steel gray speculum so it's a little bit more muted as they fly through the woods. Their diet is mostly acorns, berries, and grapes, and they make delicious table fare. Uh, they are year-round residents here. They weigh about one and a half pounds. They're brightly colored. The males are beautifully colored, and the females are, again, a little bit more drab, but they have that beautiful white eye, uh, patch. Wood ducks are a success story here in the United States. They're a conservation success story. They were in serious decline in the 19th century due to habitat loss and overhunting, uh, but because of the implementation of hunting regulations nationwide, because of the enforcement of those regulations, because of habitat restoration, and because we provide cavity boxes for them, they have made a major comeback. Love seeing these in the woods. They will, the babies, this is pretty fun, the babies will fall out of the nest and sometimes it's 60 feet up in a tree and that happens about a day after they're born. They wait until the next morning after and then they're taken care of on the ground. So now I want to switch to the diving ducks. So the diving ducks could include the sea ducks. They prefer, they prefer large, deep, and open water. They have less colorful wings. They are more black and white, as you will see. They dive to considerable depths for food, and they eat fish, shellfish, mollusks, and aquatic plants. They sit low in the water. They have to get a running start before they take off. Their speculums are drab. They're not nearly as tasty as a dabbling duck. They use their feet as rudders when flying and they are some, their feet are sometimes visible and flat. They often run along the surface of the water when they're trying to get airborne. And they will swim long distances underwater to escape enemies and pop up for a quick breath before submerging again. Again, they sit low in the water. So their favorite diet is aquatic uh, in invertebrates. But right here, I have a, let's see here, canvas back. 
Canvas backs are one of the larger uh, divers. They have a beautiful red head. They have a long, narrow beak, very long and pointed, which kind of separates them from the redheads, which you'll see in a minute. The old time waterfowlers did call this the king of ducks. They're the swiftest of all the ducks. They migrate statewide and the largest numbers of them are seen at Lake Erie. So take a drive to Lake Erie and have an opportunity to see this duck. One of the things that it uh, is currently finding at Lake Erie, and this is partly due to our invasive quagga and zebra mussels, they find clear water. The clear water allows the eelgrass and the wild celery to grow. So the canvas backs uh, uh, gather there in great numbers to eat that plant. Their irises in the breeding season and they do have this long sloping bill. Their wing beats are rapid and noisy and their speed, body size and head shape separate them from redheads and scop. So now we have the redhead. This is the most common breeding diving duck in the US. It's common statewide. It overwinters where open water is available. It likes the clean of canvas backs. So we have both of these together. So you'll often see these two ducks on the water in the same groups. And I'll tell you, after a spring of heading to my local lake, it's a lot of fun when you see these guys dipping and diving and swimming around in a small open area where there's just a little bit of ice removed from the lake. They always fly as if they're in a hurry. They spend their day in large rafts. Now what a raft is, is a raft is a group of ducks. And so when I say they're swimming in rafts, that means they're swimming with a lot of other ducks. So especially during migrations, particularly the spring migration as the ice leaves the lakes and and the ice continues to leave them as you travel north, you're going to find a lot of these ducks gather together as they journey north. They weigh about two and a half pounds. 80% of North American redheads winter in Texas or Mexico, so you might want to do some migrating of your own to see these ducks in another state. They are omnivores and they also make a tasty meal. So now I have the ring neck duck. Now, the ring neck duck is very, very difficult to see the ring of the neck. It really is kind of a odd name for it. I mean, it's there, but you can't really see it very well. One of the easier identifiers is the colorful beak with a black tip at the end of it. The peaked head of the ring neck is different than the rounded head of the scop. So you can kind of see a difference there. In the back, well, kind of hard to tell on this one. Um, they do breed and winter. their breeding and wintering grounds do not really overlap. They are winter visitors in Central America, the Northern Caribbean, and they can be spotted in Trinidad and Venezuela. So that's where they go for the winter. They are very uncommon here in the winter, but they're common here during migration. They like fresh marshes, and woody habitats. They like aquatic insects and aquatic plants. Their wings are dark. They fly in small flocks. They're similar to a scop, but they're, and the ring doesn't show in the field. Scop's uh, beak is a little, or bill is a little bit different. golden eye, named for that golden eye, sometimes referred to as a whistler. In my statewide, they overwinter on the Great Lakes if they're not frozen. They like fast moving water and rapids. There's also another duck that's in the United States called the Barrows golden eye, very similar to this, but it's mostly a Western duck. The, 
the hens look the same. The barrow is not as wary as the common golden eye. The common golden eye is going to probably take off quickly if it is startled. So they're a little bit more shy, I would say. They have a white cheek patch, a white breast, white in their wings, green head, but a lot of white. You see a lot of white on the water when you see this one. Lesser scop, also known as the bluebill. Now, um, that bluebill is certainly more prevalent when they are in their mating colors. These, these ducks all molt at least uh, once a year. Some of them actually, I, I do recall, they're, they're in more of a continuous molt, but that means they're gonna lose their feathers. They're gonna be unable to fly for a time. So this one is common statewide just before the freeze up. They live in marshes and ponds. They mainly eat animal matter, but they will also eat plants. There are two species of scalp in America. The North American uh, has the greater and lesser scalp. They will eat zebra mussels. So thankfully there's one uh, native bird or migratory bird that will take care of some of our invasive species. The buffle head has a large white patch. Now, it looks quite similar really to the golden eye. The golden eye has the patch of white in front of the eye. The buffle head has the, the white patch behind the eye. It extends from cheek to cheek across the back of the head, kind of like a scarf. This is a cavity nesting duck. It is a small, it's small with a bold black and white pattern. The head, aside from that white patch, is iridescent green and purple. So it is, when it sits on the water, it's mostly gonna be white and black, and it is gonna appear smaller than the other ducks around it. It moves just ahead of the freeze up in small groups of five or six, and it keeps a low swift flight. It's a duck that prefers the sea coast and the Gulf of Mexico for overwinter. Here we have the hooded merganser. It's a interesting little bird with its major hood here on the back of its, uh, the crust on the back of its head. It's common in the state my, during migration and it actually breeds in the state of Ohio as well. It likes forested wetlands and it is a cavity nester. They have short wing beats. They're the smallest of the mergansers. And one thing about the mergansers that's different than all the other ducks, all the mergansers have a really long pointed beak, which they use for fishing. They are a fish eating duck. So they use their long narrow serrated bill to help them catch fish. There are two other uh, mergansers in, the, in Ohio at times or in the United States. This one, the common merganser is on your screen and it is, uh, it has a long narrow serrated bill as well. And the feet of this, the feet and the uh, legs are deep red during breeding. They are one of our larger ducks. And the red-breasted merganser, the third of our ducks, is not one to nest in cavities. It has a long, narrow bill, which also eats meat. So what some of these mergansers have been known to eat a fish that's up to a foot long. So that's pretty crazy. And the last little duck I want to show you from the PowerPoint is the ruddy duck. 
This duck, I do not have a sample of it here, but it has a stiff neck and a slightly peaked head, and it holds its stiff tail at an upward angle in the water. These ducks are helpless on land. They have a scoop-shaped bill. They have, they have a very fast wing beat, kind of like bumblebees in flight. Here are two ducks that you would find in uh, south, the southern part of the United States. They might be in Florida or Texas for you. They're not common up here, but sometimes they fly north of where they're supposed to be. So you might just see a vulvous whistling duck or a black bellied whistling duck. They mostly eat plant matter. Or perhaps you're going to take a trip over to the coast. You might have an opportunity to see one of the three scoters that makes their home in the United States. The surf scoter, the white winged scoter, or the black scoter. The surf scoter is also called the skunk head. As you can see, their head is white and black. Now these birds will be seen in Ohio. And then we have some of the sea ducks, the long-tailed duck, the common eider, and the harlequin, harlequin duck. And um, long before I was really paying attention to ducks, I did see a harlequin duck in Ohio and right away knew I had something pretty special to see. So keep your eyes open. You never know when a bird is going to be off their mark. There are geese, four, four kinds or so that migrate and, and they actually more than four kinds because there's a lot of species of Canada geese, different sizes. So there's Brants, Canada geese, snow geese, and white fronted geese, and we're all familiar with the Canada goose. We will see a couple of other ones as we take our tour around this nature center in a minute. And then we have the swans. Trumpeter swans are beautiful. Now they are also in the middle of a comeback story. They're big birds. They weigh about 28 pounds. They stand about four feet high. They have about a seven foot wingspan but they, we, they have been released at several sites in Ohio. They are being monitored. They do have tracking devices on them. They are beautiful, gorgeous uh, native bird. And the tundra swan, that is a true migrator for swans statewide. You can see it mostly near Lake Erie and northeastern Ohio. They might be seen in people's open agricultural fields. I saw a flock of about 300 of them a couple years ago that were all sitting down in a farmer's field that was slightly flooded and there was plenty of a grain for them to eat. They do migrate all the way up to the tundra regions of Canada. And then lastly, there is an invasive mute swan that is seen in Ohio, and it's not one that we want to have around here because it does tend to be aggressive and it tends to um, take over some of the habitat spaces from our other swans. So please now, I want, would like for you to join us, Rochelle and I, on a quick tour of the species that make the wetlands their home. She's going to take a little tour around here with her camera and you will get a chance to see almost every variety of duck we talked about today. And you will also have the opportunity right now to learn and realize that all of our ducks, all of our waterfowl in Ohio rely on wetlands. But wetlands aren't just home to ducks and waterfowl. They're home to all kinds of other birds, water birds, and shore birds, land birds. They're home to all kinds of mammals, beavers and muskrats and mink, and they're home to uh, reptiles, snakes and turtles. They're home to amphibians. They're home to aquatic insects. They are all relying on the wonderful wetlands that we have. 
and that we are starting to have more of here in Ohio as we as we uh, continue to create new habitat and restore the habitat that we've had for so long. Back in the day, in the early settling of Ohio, we did eliminate a lot of wetlands and we've come to realize that we need wetlands here, not only for the waterfowl, not only for the wildlife, not only for the aquatic plants that rely on them, but we need them for ourselves because they clean the water and they slow the water so that we don't have flooding and they clear the sediment out of the water so that we don't have algal blooms on Lake Erie and other places where we rely on that water for drinking. If there are any questions that we can answer, I would be happy to start answering questions. Hey, Cindy, I was just about to, just about to bring that up. Um, we do have one question. Um, the person came in as anonymous, but they said, I do have a question on nesting boxes for ducks and maybe other waterfowl. What's the time of year that they should be put out? Should they be cleaned out every year? And will the ducks only raise one brood or two? Oh, those are all good questions. Um, they do need to be cleaned out every year. Wood ducks do not um, replenish those materials. So in a wood duck box, you would put wood shavings in there. And so those need to definitely be restored in those wood boxes. So although they use a nest that could be six, 60 feet up in a tree, a cavity, they will also nest right on the water in those wood duck boxes. I would um, have them out very early in the season because wood ducks, you know, they're even staying here in Ohio where they can find open water. So they're, mo they're moving through pretty early in the year. And let me think, you had a third prong to that question. What was it? Do you remember? Um, there, yeah, there's actually there's actually a list of questions here. Uh, what time of year should they be put out? Should I would be? say probably what? March. March, at least by March, at least by early March. OK, um, should they be cleaned out? You talked about that. Will the ducks only raise one brood or two? Um, that sometimes they may start a second brood if the first brood wasn't successful. Some birds do have more than one brood. Okay, will the ducks use them if they are not over open water? Yeah, a lot of ducks will nest. Um, they will nest closer to the shoreline, especially if they're in a natural cavity. A lot of those natural cavities are within the woods, so they would use them, but it is better to put them in, in the water to say okay. for safety from predators as well. Right, um, kind of related, must the nesting box be placed on a post in the water or can it be placed at the end of a dock or on a tree by the water? Hold on, let me check with Rochelle on that. I would have to say that most of the time we are going to put them on a pole near the water um, we can get predator guards to put underneath of it so that raccoons and snakes can't find their way into the box. Um, but putting it on a dock wouldn't be the greatest because, well, it's used by us and we don't want to put a lot of presents um, at that breeding site so that the mother feels safe and she'll keep returning back to that nest instead of just abandoning it. That is a very good point, Rochelle. All right. Well, ladies, that is all the questions we have. Cindy and Rochelle, thank you so much. Um, really appreciate your time today. And I just want to remind everybody that next week uh, we will have uh, Catherine and Sean Connor from Houston Woods will be on talking to us about Ohio's owls. Um, and they'll have some live birds, so you don't want to miss that one. Um, however, just remember that next week the webinar is going to start at 11 o'clock instead of our usual 10. So 11 o'clock next week, Ohio's Owl. Be sure to join us. And thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.